Well, I haven't driven you all completely away yet, but I'll keep working on it tonight. <clears throat> I, I, I suspect the reason the audience is so good tonight is you think you're here for the Rum Diaries with Johnny Depp. <laughs> I, I was at four o'clock, I'm sorry, you, you missed it. Um, the B Word project on campus, as you know, as I told you before, uh, uh, got a grant uh, from the Doris Duke Foundation for a lot of money to reach out into the community, and this is just one of the many things we're doing. But if you go to um, www.csulb.edu um, and look up the B Word project, you can find out all the things that are going on around town and on the campus that are free of charge, thanks to the Doris Duke Foundation and all the money it made <laughs> off of her cigarettes. Um, <laughs> She was a wonderful lady. I met her one time, and, and she made contributions to other things I did. She was a tremendous advocate of the First Amendment, but smoked like a chimney. Um, also, uh, I'm, you may have noticed this nice young man in the back of the room. Uh, he is recording these lectures, and they are also available on the B Word Project. If you just go to the B Word Project and then videos, uh, you can click on me or Spartacus or or, or whatever, uh, in order to get uh, the lectures. And there's also a link uh, being established uh, from my Center for First Amendment Studies. Uh, just a reminder, our last lecture for the semester is November 15th, two weeks from tonight, and the film is The Front with Woody Allen. And uh, it, it, I'm, I'm using for my example the man who actually wrote The Front because he used fronts, because he was blacklisted. And he is related to uh, one of the professors in our history department, and so I can tell his story rather intimately uh, about how this fronting worked and how difficult it was uh, to work on television in Hollywood once you were either blacklisted or graylisted. Uh, so that will be our last one. And then we're posting very soon the syllabus for the spring semester. If you thought this was a little racy, wait till the spring semester. I mean, there, we're doing five films that are, uh, have to do with indecency and obscenity. <coughs> I won't, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Put a kick back in your life. Um, the, 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 uh, the films are listed on the syllabus and we'll start in, in, in February. Uh, with definitions, you know, if you don't know the difference between obscenity and indecency now, you will by the end of that semester. Um, and we'll also look at the attempts by some people to equate violence with indecency and, and regulate it that way. So um, that, that, that'll be up uh, at, uh, over at the Col uh, College of Extension Services and also on the B Word Project uh, for next semester. Um, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about libraries and librarians, and this is a, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. First of all, in my senior year in high school, I was hired to be uh, a librarian uh, down in National City, California, which is just south of San Diego and north of Tijuana. And uh, I learned the Dewey Decimal System only for it to be, you know, later thrown out and now we use the other system. But it was uh, one of the things that helped me pay my way through college because my parents could not afford to put me through college. I had to get scholarships and work and do all that stuff. So I learned all about libraries and librarians and it was kind of fun. And then of course, once you're in college, you learn to use the library in a less fun way. You have to go over there and do research and write papers. And uh, that I did. And then in graduate school, the same thing. And then once I became a professor, I started writing about different people. And I had to do a paper, uh, I wrote an article once on, on uh, William Howard Taft in his inaugural address. And I went to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., which is a beautiful building, which uh, in, in the front, in the foyer, has one of the Gutenberg Bibles from 1456 to 1459 when he printed those big, huge Bibles, and they're all in Latin, and they turn one page every day so it gets even where. Now, since you can all read Latin, you should go to Washington, D.C. and see that, but you should also go into the Library of Congress and just look around. It's, it's, it's absolutely glorious. So my experience with libraries has always been a very, very good one. 
But today, we have a particular tension in our society regarding libraries. There's a tension between national security and protecting us from people who do bad things and protecting your privacy. What books you check out from the library, what movies you check out from the library, how you access the library from your computer and what that says about you. That tension has been increased since 9-11 for good reasons. We came under attack and we need to prevent those kinds of attacks. But balancing your Fourth Amendment right to privacy against national security has become difficult. The Patriot Act had unintended consequences because the government's action was to violate the standards of the American Library Association and the First and Fourth Amendment rights of persons using libraries. Now, I've been close to the American Library Association for a long time because they worked with me on a number of First Amendment projects, and the Freedom of Read Committee of the American Library Association has often uh, uh, put my books on their list so that, that people will read them. So I'm, I'm very defensive when it comes to the rights of the American Library Association. However, Title II of the Patriot Act requires librarians to supply information about users to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Section 215 of Title II, the library provision, allows the FBI to investigate U.S. citizens' library records and to obtain copies of them. Furthermore, the provision prohibits librarians from di disclosing to their users that a patron might be under investigation. So librarians have been put in a very untenable position. They come into the library and uh, the FBI comes into the library and says, I want you know, the, the files on Jim Warsham you know, with the, the Long Beach Community Foundation because he's a dangerous man in the community. And, and uh, you have to give, as a librarian, you have to give them Jim's files. But you can't tell Jim that you did that, which uh, causes all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of troubles. The FBI has been using libraries to gather information since the 1960s when it sought the records of anti-Vietnam War demonstrators or Soviet spies using research facilities, like the demonstrators were equivalent to spies. In, in 1970, the Division of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF, which is part of the IRS, hi, <laughs> also relied on library records to search down people doing research on explosives. The library section of the Patriot Act were a revision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Surveillance Act passed in 1978 which built a wall between domestic and foreign investigations. So starting in 1978 with FISA, the FBI could not share information with the CIA, and the CIA could not share information with the FBI, and we noticed that that led to problems after 9-11, and so that wall was torn down. Uh, by the Patriot Act so that the FBI and the CIA could exchange information, which means that when the FBI gets information about your library use, they can share it with the CIA, who can then share it with Interpol. And so you may be a criminal in Amsterdam tonight, you just don't know. <laughs> this is as convoluted as the plot to Anonymous. I don't know if you've seen this Shakespeare movie yet, but take notes. I mean, it is very confusing. It's very confusing, but I digress. So this wall fell down between the FBI and the CIA, and they're now sharing that information. Librarians immediately objected to the provision of the Patriot Act, arguing that it chilled a citizen's willingness to do research on topics related to terrorism, Islam, Osama bin Laden, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the like. It shut down inquiries that might make citizens more knowledgeable and tolerant of Islam. The conflict arose from the ALA's, ALA's Code of Ethics, which reads, quote, we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and materials consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. So they can either break the law or break their Code of Ethics. Once again, we were witness to a tension between national security and civil liberties. In 2008 alone, 
9,221 public libraries served 166 million registered borrowers with 300 million reference transactions and 2 billion circulations across 1 billion library visits. These figures do not include internet access, which is available at 71% of the libraries. Eventually, the Inspector General's office began to examine and question some of the tactics of the FBI. The Inspector General found that between 2003 and 2005, at least 22% of the requests by the FBI were not properly documented. The courts also got involved when a district judge ruled in 2004 that the FBI should discontinue its use of national security letters to obtain information. As a result, in 2006, Congress reformed Section 215 of the Patriot Act. However, many believe that the reform did not go far enough because Congress was intimidated by the release of information by the government that libraries had been frequented by the 9-11 hijackers. In 2007, a district judge found that the revision of the law still ran afoul of the First Amendment. And so the tension continues to this day between the needs of protecting us, the needs of counterterrorism and national security, and your right to privacy and to check out a book in the library. So we have several issues that we face today. What books should be available in libraries? Who should have access to those books? Children, adults, what age? Can the government obtain that information as to who is accessing the books? And should you know when the government has requested that information about you. That's where we sit today. But now I want to take you back to when the film that we were about to see was made. Censorship of libraries began way before Joe McCarthy. They hit a high point, in fact, in 1947. The State Department runs libraries for its information agency, and it began removing books from overseas libraries when the Cold War began in 1946. Domestically, there were 10,000 city libraries in 1947 and over 20,000 school libraries. They were accredited by the American Library Association, which was founded in 1876. In 1947, loyalty oaths were required of all publicly employed librarians. When I took my job in high school as a high school senior at my little library in National City, California, I was fingerprinted and had to take the loyalty oath. So I can't get away with anything. <laughs> Groups like the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Daughters of the American Revolution, and the Chamber of Commerce called for removal of books favorable to or about Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, Red Emma Goldman, Communism, Communist Themes, the Soviet Union, and Red China. California, believe it or not, proved a hotbed of censorship, starting as early as 1947. For example, the California Committee on Un-American Activities and the California Society of the Sons of the American Revolution focused their attacks on Margaret Stewart's Land of the Soviets and another group of books called the Building America series. The California House on American Activities was started by State Senator Jack Tenney and ran from 1941 to 1949. At one point, it summoned before it songwriter Ira Gershwin to testify about his participation in the Committee for the First Amendment. A Democrat turned Republican, Tenney investigated singer Paul Robeson and denounced actor Edward G. Robinson as tools of the Communist Party. The story has a happy ending. In 1949, Tenney was removed as head of the committee by his own party because he was overzealous. He never won political office again. But before that, the legislation cut funding for future books in the series and local libraries often were pressured to remove them. In 1948, San Bernardino librarians responded point by point to legislative attacks. The New York City Board of Education banned Howard Fast's book on the patriot Thomas Paine in 1947. He was then called before the House on American Activities Committee and in 1950 was sentenced to three months in jail for contempt. 
The New York City Board of Education then banned the magazine The Nation on the grounds that its criticism of Catholic opposition to communism was hurtful to Catholics. I'm a Catholic and never hurt my feelings. <laughs> At the 1948 American Library Association's Nationalist Meeting, novelist Pearl S. Buck, the author of many books on China, Oil for the Lamps of China and so on, warned that, quote, censorship is the first step toward book burning and book burning throughout history has been a sign of dictators. Now, if you go back in history, there was a monk that took over the city of Florence and he burned all the books in 1498, and we all know that Hitler had a gigantic bonfire in 1936. Nonetheless, Birmingham, Alabama School Board banned the magazine Senior Scholastic from schools <laughs> because it contained an article on the importance of brotherhood among friends. See, that was obviously a subtext for becoming comrades, which then made us communists. So senior scholastic, devilishly little magazine, subversive. Um, so at that point, the American Library Association passed the Library, Librarian Bill of Rights, which contains also its, its code of ethics. However, with the rise of Joseph McCarthy in 1950, even more pressure was put on librarians to remove books and magazines on communism. The worst case came in Boston in 1952. Now, Boston already had a reputation when it came to banning books. If you were banned in Boston, you became a bestseller. I mean, you know, they, they, bon, they, they banned James Joyce's Ulysses, you know, anything that had anything risky in it, they banned it, and then, you know. The Boston Post, a conservative newspaper, attacked the Boston Public Library, one of the largest in America. It condemned the library for subscribing to Pravda and Izvestia, the Soviet newspapers, and for containing books on Stalin and Lenin, while at the same time not having a copy of a single book written by Joe McCarthy. <laughs> the Boston Herald then stepped in to defend the library, and a major battle ensued between the two newspapers. In February 1953, Senator Joseph McCarthy focused the attention of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the Senate, Committee on Government Operations, onto reports of subversive books on the shelves of overseas libraries. In response, the American Library Association formed the Freedom to Read Commission. Ray Cohen, the aide to Joe McCarthy, actually traveled to Europe to investigate what books were on the shelves of U.S. libraries abroad. Soon after his visit, and he took his friend Shine with him, the little sergeant that he loved, soon after his visit, books were actually taken from State Department libraries and burned. This was admitted by Secretary of State John Foster Dulles under oath before Senate committees. In 1954, President Eisenhower gave a commencement address at Dartmouth College in which he implored the, st the students to be courageous in these troubling times. Finally turning on McCarthy, Eisenhower said, quote, don't join the book burners. Don't think you are going to conceal faults by concealing evidence that they ever existed. Don't be afraid to go into your library and read every book as long as any document does not offend our own ideas of indecency. That should be the only censorship. How will we defeat communism unless we know what it is? Now we have, to, now we have got to fight it with something better, not try to conceal the thinking of our own people. Slowly, the crisis ended. So, just like last time, this evening's feature stars Betty Davis, who works as a librarian who comes under attack by the McCarthyists. Now, Betty Davis, as you saw last, or two weeks ago, in The Little Foxes, was a proven star. Uh, one of her early movies uh, was Jezebel, for which she won an Academy Award, uh, Dark Victory, where she plays a, 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 a rich playgirl who finds out she has a fatal disease and it changes her life and she becomes very serious. She, of course, starred opposite Henry Fonda in Jezebel and opposite Ronald Reagan in Dark Victory. At the, at the time of tonight's film, Betty Davis was married to Gary Merrill, with whom she had fallen in love while making the stellar film All About Eve, one of her greatest performances. 
Well, Davis was a pro-union activist. It was very, the very liberal Gary Merrill that made her aware of the threat of McCarthy and why she agreed to make this low-budget B film. Storm Center, by the way, which you're going to see tonight, was supposed to star, of all people, Mary Pickford in her comeback after 23 years of not making a movie. But she, she withdrew from the film when she became ill, and Davis agreed to make it, hoping to reinforce the fall of McCarthy, who had been censored by the Senate at this point and would eventually die of alcoholism. The film also stars Brian Keith and Kim Hunter. When Davis's character refuses to remove books from a small town library, small town library, she is fired. And that starts the plot of this film.